started. Even though we only have six people? Um, I'll tell you what, I'll raise the board. Why don't you guys think of questions? I'm going to do a uh, demo today. This is a demo that's um, it's in most demos. The concept is very clear, and the demo is um, typically a lot less clear than the concept. Um, this demo, which one of the students told me about, I had actually heard about it from a colleague maybe 30 years ago, but um, he never actually showed it to me, so I didn't know what it was. So I did it this afternoon. Maybe to reward those who came on time, I'll do the demo twice. Um, so let's see, Can um, I need somebody, maybe could you maybe come forward and just um, Put your hand here and hold this down. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you, well, you, you have to be held down with enormous force. And we will put the camera on it. Okay. Now we've got this bison label here. Okay. So I'm going to rotate by, that's what, 180, 360. And normally that's, uh, that's what we call a rotation. But you see, I can't seem to undo the knot there. However, did I rotate this way? Yeah. Is that the way I rotate? Yeah. I'm going to rotate another 360. And now we've got two kinks in it. And somehow I got it out earlier this afternoon. So let me see what it is. I just sort of move it forward and pull it back, and it's gone. Whoa. <laughs> now, this has <laughs> this has something. Well, um, all right. Let me do it again since you're standing here. One eighty, three sixty, twice three sixty, which I guess is seven twenty. And now somehow I can. Should I able, was able to do this pretty easily a moment ago. Yeah, there it is. Um, so what this, now, as I said, the demo is clear. You can see what happens. What's not clear is what it means. Dirac's interpretation, damn it, I forgot to bring the chalk. Dirac's interpretation is simply that E, you know that E to the I beta dot sigma over 2, this is the way we represent rotations for a spin one half field. E to the I 2 pi sigma dot theta, well, let us say uh, sigma dot theta hat, so that's a 2 pi rotation. This turns out to be minus 1. And the way you get 1 is e to the i 4 pi sigma dot theta hat over 2. And that's equal to plus 1. And somehow this is illustrated for the case of this um, belt. Um, I'm going to try to get more chalk from the physics department. I'll be back.
Okay. Now, in string theory, that I think this plays a this may be a little clearer, but um, all right. Anyway, let me um, uh, mention something important with regard to the homework. It was a typo in one of the problems. So let me um, clarify that typo. It was problem three, the second line of problem three. It should have looked like this. Sum S equals minus to plus VL of P and S, VL prime star of P and S. It's 1 over 2P0 minus I gamma A P A minus M. And then I left out an I. It's I gamma 0 LL prime. Are you going to issue a new company? Excuse me, are you going to email out a new copy? Uh, I guess I can. Uh, yeah, I'll do that. Sure. Which homework is this? This is, this is the homework that's due Wednesday, tentatively. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> so there are, there are th three problems. I think the first two are pretty easy. The third one, I don't think is impossible. All right, now, what I don't quite remember is how far I got last time. Um, does anybody remember? Well, let me, let me just remind you of some of this. The action density here is minus psi bar dA gamma A plus m psi, which is sometimes written as minus psi d slash plus m psi. Um, psi bar is psi dagger and an i gamma zero. It turns out that that notation psi bar, it looks pretty weird, but it turns out that it's that it's, um, it, that it's useful. The Dirac equation is, whoops. D slash plus M, remember D slash is the derivative times the gamma. And um, we're representing a Dirac field. So let us just say that we have two. The Dirac field is 1 over root 2. We have two equal mass Majorana fields. We add them together. And uh, the Dirac field then is psi L of x is the sum on S from minus to plus integral dqp over 2 pi to the 3 halves. And um, what we've got here is ul p and s. Um, this is a spinner then. b of p and s. PX plus VL of P and S. And this now is C dagger of P and S e to the minus I of PX. And so this annihilates particles, creates antiparticles. So, so particles, and this one, anti. Um, so, well, let me just review some of the things that we've been doing. We have
have the anti-commutation relations are B of P and S, B dagger of whether say Q and T is delta uh, S T delta P minus Q and it looks like that. And a similar relation for the C's. hits for the Dirac operator d sledge plus m on psi of x, well this is a sum integral d to p 2 pi to the 3 halves. I'm putting my arm down to sort of indicate that. This is then i gamma uh, a p a plus m u b e e i p x plus and uh, here it's i gamma a p a um, plus m v c dagger c dagger p x e to the minus i p x I'm, I'm a little puzzled. This should be a minus sign here. Um, yes, there is a minus sign. Sorry. Minus there. Minus here because there's a minus there. And so we see the Dirac equation will satisfy, the Dirac field will satisfy Dirac equations if the spinners satisfy the equation um, I gamma A, or let me use the slash notation. It'll make things a little bit easier to write. Let me use up this space here then. Um, if I p slash, no, it's I p slash. I p slash plus m u of p and s is zero and minus I p slash plus m v of p of s is zero. And what I I think worked through last time is that this will be true as long as u of p of s is m minus i p slash on some u of 0 and s and v of p and s is uh, m plus i p slash v of 0 and s. And so we went through that last time I think and then the question was, well, what are the um, u of 0 and s and v of 0 and s? And if you, and they, of course, have to satisfy these equations at p equals 0. p equals 0 means p0 is m and p vector is 0. And so that equation is minus i gamma 0 m plus m u of 0 s is 0 which is effectively just um, minus i gamma 0 plus 1 u of 0 and s is 0. The corresponding equation for v is i gamma 0 plus 1 v of 0 and s equals 0. And so u is an eigenvector of i gamma 0 with eigenvalue plus 1 and v of 0 and s is an eigenvalue of, an eigenvector of i gamma 0, eigenvalue minus 1. Anyway, I wrote down what the choices were. They're in these notes that I mailed out. And um, one way of writing these spinners is to recognize that the Dirac Lorentz transformation, which is d one half zero of L zero zero d zero one half of L. These being two by two. So let me see. Do I? Yeah, this is erased. 
Steve of L. Well. P of L is 1 over the square root of 2m p0 plus m and it's p0 plus m minus p dot sigma 0, 0, p0 plus m plus p dot sigma 0. And um, another way of writing that is actually quite nice. It's p slash gamma 0 plus m over the square root of 2m p0 plus m. And in fact, that's one of your homework problems. You're supposed to show that this is equal to that. And that's not the most difficult thing in the world. And it turns out then that um, you can see that u of p and s is square root of m over p0 d of l on u of 0 and s, and v of p and s is square root of m over p0, d of l on d of 0 and s. So these are the properties of the direct spinners. And then as a homework problem, second homework problem, you're supposed to show that the that the spin sum at zero, the, the zero momentum spin sums are UL zero S U star, let me use M of zero S equals uh, one half I plus I M zero L M. And similarly, VL of zero s v star m of zero s is um, one half uh, i minus i gamma zero l m. And then the third homework problem was to show that um, show these two spin sums. So I've written one of them. And uh, the other one, I uh, did not have a typo.
Actually, I have a question. Yeah. So I've heard in some of the research with neutrinos that um, they're trying to determine if it's a Majorana or a Dirac particle. Yeah. And this is related to if it's its own antiparticle or not. Yeah. Is there a way to see that here? Am I missing, am I missing well, something? Turn the camera around so that we can still explain it. Um, this is a Majorana field, this is another Majorana field, and if you have two of the same mass, you can combine them together. Okay. Now, one could say, well, the neutrino is um, represented just by this field. And then, you remember how we got these particles, how we got these um, trying to look for space. If we had written the um, if we had written the Majorana field, it would look like this. So if I goes from one to two, almost the same. The difference is we would just have A of P and S. And I'd add a 1 to say, uh, well, I, to say that it was field I. So this is the way a Majorana field would look. So you have the annihilation operator and the creation operator for the same particle. And so that would mean if, if the neutrino is a Majorana particle, it's represented by a Majorana field like this, then this field both creates and annihilates the same particle, whereas the Dirac field annihilates the particle, creates the antiparticle, and then the adjoint field, um, the adjoint field creates the particle, annihilates the antiparticle. Here, the adjoint of field I has a dagger here and a no dagger there, so it also annihilates and creates the same particle, you see. So, and in fact, in, there are some ways of writing, choosing the gamma matrices so that the Majorana field is completely real in a sense. Okay, well, there are no complex numbers at all, although obviously this is a complex number. Um, so the, the issue here, experimentally, is what's called neutrinoless double beta decay. And so what happens is, um, in a, if a neutron goes to a proton, it uh, releases an electron plus an anti-neutrino. That's the conventional way of describing it, where we think of this as a Dirac particle. But then, um, if on the other hand, these guys are not Dirac particles, but Majorana particles, then it would be releasing a neutrino. And you see, the thing can be Majorana, and it conserves charge. It also conserves angular momentum, and momentum, and energy. So then what can happen is you can have this, you can also have the reaction nu plus n goes to p plus e. So what can happen is you can have two neutrons in a nucleus going forward in time like this, and then one neutron turns into a proton, um, well, the way this happens is with um, W's and Z's. So I'll, I'll, I'll draw it for you two ways. 
This is the old way of drawing it. This is the four, fer four fermion vertex that Fermi invented. And then this guy comes over here, combines with the neutron, and produces another proton and another electron. Now, in the, the way we would write this in um, modern times is we wouldn't talk about neutrons and protons, we would talk about a down quark together with um, another down quark and an up quark, and these guys are just spectators. This one goes along and turns into an up quark. But when it does that, it lets out a W um, minus. And the W minus comes over here, and um, we have then, uh, let us say, UD, and then there's this D. And the idea is that the W minus is emitted by this guy and then absorbed by this guy. So this also turns into a U. Um, wait a minute, no, I'm, I'm doing this wrong. Hold on. The W minus, in fact, goes off here and then turns into um, an electron and uh, the neutrino. Uh, and then this, all right, so I've drawn it again in a, in a more awkward way. Sorry, I'm, I'm doing this on the fly. So this W minus comes up, turn, releases an electron, and then a neutrino. And the neutrino comes over. Now this guy also re releases a W minus, um, which turns into another electron, and it absorbs the, the new. So in, in other words, this W minus emits a, a, a new, a, a, a neutrino, which is then absorbed by this W minus, and uh, out comes an electron. So this can happen if the thing is a Majorana particle. And you would ask, well, what are all these funny lines here? Well, this line is um, a, a W propagator, and so it's going to be the propagator for a magnetic vector boson, and this one would be the propagator for a Dirac particle. Actually, no, a Majorana particle, and um, what I'm going to be deriving this afternoon is the Dirac propagator for a, a Dirac particle, and there's just a small change to make it Majorana. Yeah. So are the W bosons, Dirac particles, or my Oh, no, 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 no. The W bosons are bosons, so they're not oh, Dirac yeah, at yeah. all. Yeah. They're spin one objects, and they have masses around uh, 81 GeV or so. So that's the picture of neutrinos, W, W, W. Double beta decay. Nobody knows if it happens or not, and um, so it's a. It's been looked at, ex looked for experimentally. It hasn't been seen, so they, you know, keep doing better experiments. The problem is that this doesn't happen when, when I described it as though we're free neutrons. In reality, in the actual experiments, you have a nucleus that can. Um, in which two neutrons can turn into a proton. Uh, I'm sorry, two, yes, two neutrons can turn into two protons, plus two electrons. And you then look carefully to see if there are any neutrinos coming out, yes or no. And, um, and I guess, I don't think they're detecting the neutrinos, and so um, what they're doing is they're looking, I guess, at the at the energies of the electrons and 
You see, if there are neutrinos coming out, then these electrons would have less energy. So I think that's what, what they're sensitive to, what, what they look for. All right, any other questions? I have a question. Y yes. So, in, in so you're going to be the first to get a new sample. So in the D slash, we're still summing over A, right? Summing over space time? Yes. Okay. Yeah. P slash is P lower A gamma upper A, and it's also, of course, the same thing as P upper A gamma lower A. is this? Well, by definition, this is theta of x0 minus y0 times psi L of x, psi m dagger of y. And now, you'd be expecting a plus sign. But because we're dealing with fermions, which are weird, we have a minus sign. That's the expression we've got. Now, is that theta? Uh, is that something we used before? I can't remember off the top of my head what that is. What? The theta function. Oh, good question. Theta. Theta of say. Uh, theta of u say is u plus absolute value of u. Divided by twice absolute value of u. This is the heavy side function. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So six. All right. All right. Well, I've got three chocolates to give out. Um, I don't know if it's the aroma of the fresh chocolate or whether there's something really puzzling people. So you get one. You get one, and you you ain't asked something, one. You already gave me one. I asked the the Eugene double. Yeah, but you also are the 
person who moves the camera. You're getting on for that too. <laughs> All right. Two chocolates is my daily quota. Yeah. Thanks, so. My question now. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. We for all the important thing is the question, it's not the chocolate. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. First off, are these terms commutative within the time order product? For example, can you switch around? Size? Well, no, these are operators, so they don't commute. All right. So. And in fact, if they have a chance, if you if you form the commutator, <coughs> you get something that's a mess. If you form the anti-commutator, you have a chance of getting zero or something simple. All right, um, but okay. Regardless of that, though, I'm still a bit confused because it looks like we have basically the same terms on the left and the right side of the minus sign. I mean, the only thing that's really different is that we is the order, right? But these are operators, right. and remember, so I mean, but you here when we have like a fermion. I'm just trying to see if I still have this. No, it's amazing. Whatever I need, I erase. So in other words, what we have here is b. Let me use. B and B prime, B prime for different P and different S. Well, that's not going to work. P, S, anti-commutator. This is delta Q, T, delta Q of P minus Q. And the same thing for C, C dagger. Right. Anti-commutator, same thing. So, when you have these things written one way or the other way, you're going to have um, something different. But now, what actually we get is a long story. I mean, we certainly have time for it, but let's let's not. So, did, did I answer all the questions, or is there still one hanging? Notice that this one, uh, I better pull up and, and have the, it's the positive frequency part that survives here. That is to say the part with the annihilation operators. And here, it's psi dagger minus the negative frequency part, that is to say with the creation operators. The annihilate part that is the positive frequency part here would annihilate this state over here. What do you, what do you say is positive frequency or negative frequency? Oh, it's this stupid um, jargon from the 20s. Let me, let me turn the camera around and I'll show you. This part here is called psi plus, and this part is called psi minus. And it's called positive frequency and negative frequency. I never. Uh, I mean, in what sense is this positive frequency? It actually is a negative frequency to the minus i e t. Why they call it positive frequency? I don't know. I mean, it's. I've, I've never understood that. I remember when I was a graduate student, um, people used this term, and I said to myself, you got your chocolate, right? Um, you know, what are they talking about? I don't know. But that, that's the jargon, and it's gotten frozen in there. It's, I must admit, this is probably as bad as the astronomy jargon. <laughs> Astronomers, you know, magnitudes go up in the dimmer. When they plot something, if they have a nice straight line like this, they'll plot it backwards. Um, they'll interchange up with down and minus with plus, and they get something like this, and that looks profound. Whereas this is just, you know, the first thing you learn in linear algebra. Sorry, I shouldn't be so hard on the astronomers. But I gotta admit, this is as bad as astronomy. Okay, so once again, it's psi dagger, and it would be the positive frequency part here. Or let, let me use a better notation. 
the creation operator pawn here. Okay. So in other words, the annihilation operator pawn would have annihilated the vacuum. Here, the creation operator pawn would annihilate the vacuum over here. Here, the creation operator part would annihilate this vacuum. Here, the annihilation operator part would annihilate that vacuum. So that's that. But once we have that, we can do a next step. We can add in, by means of an anti-commutator, The other part that's just zero. So this part has the uh, has the annihilation operator part on the right and the creation operator part on the left. So it's doubly zero. So we haven't added in anything. But we've got something that has a nice structure because it's an anti-commutator. And we do the same thing here. Okay, now we use our Fourier expansions of the field, the Dirac field, and the adjoint of the Dirac field to compute uh, these quantities. And um, so we've got the Dirac field written on the top of the second board. I'm going to write the adjoint of the Dirac field here, psi giga L which of course is 1 over root 2 psi 1 dagger of x minus i psi 2 dagger of x. Anyway, it's a sum on s from minus to plus integral dqp to pi to the 3 halves. And now it's just the adjoint of the thing up there so it's UL star of P and S, P dagger of P and S, <coughs> U to the minus I PX plus VL star of P and S, C of P and S, E to the I PX. So that's what it is. That's psi dagger. So we have psi over there, psi dagger here, and now we can evaluate these two anti-commutators using, of course, the standard anti-commutator reactions. Psi plus L of X, Psi dagger minus M of Y, anti commutator So this is then a sum of S and T going from minus to plus. Double integral dQp dQq 2 pi cubed. And now it's UL of P and S, E D I P X U star M of Q T, E to the minus I Q Y. And now an anti commutator of B and P and S, P dagger of Q and T. structure here. 
So UL, PS, PDI, PX, U star M, QT, E to the minus I, QY. And now in comes Kroniker, delta ST, and Dirac. And so now this terrible double sum and double integral collapses into a single sum, single integral, sum on S, integral dqp, 2 pi cubed. And now we have ul of p and s, u star m of p and s, e to the i, p minus q, whoops, it's not p minus q, it's p, x minus y. Okay, now you see why I assigned those homework problems. Well, a homework problem, when you've done all three of them, you see that this spin sum gives us integral d cubed p 2 pi cubed. And now what we have is 1 over 2 p 0 minus i gamma a p a plus m. <coughs> I gamma zero L M E to the I P <coughs> X minus Y. Just allergies. Okay. Now the next thing is that we recognize that these P's are effectively derivatives. So we can rewrite this as minus gamma a dA plus m times i gamma zero Lm integral dQp 2 pi q 2p0. And all we have here is e to the i p x minus y. Well, this should remind you of something. This is delta plus of x minus y. It's one of those relative, one of those Lorentz invariant functions. <coughs> it's so to speak the key function, and everything else is basically made out of this. So in other words, this thing is equal to, in fact, I can write this as minus p slash plus m i gamma zero acting on delta plus of x minus y and uh, ln. OK, so we've done half of this. Guess the thing is to go up to this board over here and do the rest of it. So what I used there was this top spin sum. We're going to have to use the bottom spin sum to do the other anti-commutation.
Oh, wait, do I have y and x to change? I'll get this right. I don't want things screwed up here. I have dagger plus and <coughs> y. Side L minus x. Okay. All right, so this is fine. But now notice this is an anti commutator. So, what an anti commutator is, is this is equal to this times this plus this times that in the opposite order. So, this is certainly the same thing as psi minus L of Y psi dagger plus M of X. But so you just changing what you're calling x and y? Because, I mean, they are... Yeah. Do you have your x and y... screw up? Yeah. You just need to switch x and y in, in this yeah. anti-commutator right here. All right, well, wait a minute. No, I don't mean to. So I've got some dagger plus the y here. Yeah, I've got some dagger plus the y. And, and that's side dagger plus of y. Every yeah, but this one is you have side dagger plus of x. Duh! All right, I must have had my arm down. All right, thanks. All right, so who gets the two chocolates for correcting me? You can split it, maybe. Um, All right, let's right, Here, you, you do it. Let's do the same on the right hand side. Yes. Okay. It's a good thing I bought another bag <laughs> a couple of days ago. Alright, so this is what we have to compute. And so this is equal to, again, a double sum. And a double integral. But now it's VL of P and S e to the minus I PX because it's the creation operator part. Yeah, I'm going to start using this window, the, the standard expression is no simpler and completely stupid, I think. So this is C dagger of P and S, anti-commutator of C of Q and T. So that's what we've got. Let me just see how much I've got left here. Not that much. Okay. So this is then sum on ST now it's um what do you put those? these together uh, and now what is this? It's delta uh, st delta q p minus q and so that collapses this into a sum on s integral dqp and now this spin sum, VL, PS, VM, star, PS, E to the minus I, P, X minus Y. And now using this expression here, this spin sum, what we see is that this is equal to 
integral b cubed p 2 pi cubed 2 p 0. Now we've got minus i gamma a p a minus m i gamma 0 l m e b i p x minus y. Actually, my shoulder is killing me um, from all these uh, all this writing. So let me pause for a minute. We'll do story time if I have a story. Um, let's see, I told you about the 48 election in Texas when Lyndon Johnson was uh, calling his friends on the Rio Grande um, and having him produce a vote total that was 100 to 1 in favor of Lyndon Johnson. Um, and then he, he was still behind because he wasn't supposed to know what the total was. Anyway, the call came through. We were still behind a couple of hundred and so they got some, called some precinct and some guy found a box of ballots that had been lost, hadn't been counted. And um, there was a few hundred votes. They were all for Lyndon Johnson. And they were in alphabetical order. <laughs> and in fact, they were signed with the same pen. I think maybe possibly with the same handwriting. Maybe even with the same signature. I don't know. But um, anyway, that was, that was that. So then in the, so. When did they find that out? Huh? When did they find all that out? I didn't know. I mean, I'm not a historian. I'm just learning this from Caro's biographies of Johnson. Um, when Johnson got to the Senate, he did a pretty good job, um, at least as a senator from Texas, um, representing the construction industry of Brown and the oil industry of um, others. Um, Brown was a principal in the corporation called Brown and Root, which Halliburton bought maybe 10 years ago. When I was on sabbatical at NIH, I was just amazed at the stuff that Brown and Root was doing. Um, there was, for example, a certain building and ground floor, when I first started working there, beginning of my sabbatical, was perfect. I mean, you know, but what happened was they changed from being uh, a department of this to a department of that. But you know, it was perfectly set up with glass and partitions and air conditioning and the rest of it. And Brown and Root came in, destroyed everything, pulled it all out, rebuilt everything from scratch, and charged the government or NIH, you know, God knows how much. Just a scandal, and they. Had, I was working on the second floor of that building, and they had. They had worked. Brown and Root had been in and out of the second floor so often that um, the air conditioning system was and heating system was completely screwed up. <laughs> so there were microclimates. You would go from one guy's office to another office, and it would go from winter to summer. It was one person who was actually a very important physicist, uh, Adrian Parsegian, and he had, his office was in the end of the building. It was freezing in there, <laughs> and, and it was Washington, so it was humid, and so it was this cold, damp room, <laughs> and he was suffering, um, and uh, the, the the people who ran NIH um, in cooperation with Brown and Root, Brown and Root apparently told them what to do because this was the W administration, so one had to keep Dick Cheney happy. And um, so, so uh, they decided that they were going to move that half of the group on that floor to a different building across the street, and they were going to reconstruct that building. So Brown and Root went into that building, destroyed everything, rebuilt it. 
they didn't do that great a job rebuilding it. It looked it looked like something from um, um, Baghdad, uh, and um, so Adrian's office, my uh, Adrian's office was moved over there. I stayed in the same building, and um, it was. That building is probably still dusty. Um, so, all right. So that's enough story time, I guess. Um, um, so we we gotten <coughs> to this expression then for the second commutator. Now let's put them two together. Um, And putting them together is, is what happens is quite nice, and it's just a little bit tricky. It's not know, it's not deep, but it's what, what we got at this stage. You see, is the mean value in the vacuum of the free theory, time ordered product, sine L of x. This is what it is by definition. And as I said, it's this time-ordered product with the funny minus sign. All right, now let me just get this straight. All right, I'll put in all these. I'm not gonna, so it's theta of x0 minus y0. Wait a minute. All right, I'm sort of reminding you what this is. Psi L of x, psi dagger m of y, and then this crucial minus sign. In the case of boson fields, there's no minus sign here. This is only for fermionic fields. Heavy side function y0 minus x0 psi m dagger of y psi l of x. Bare vacuum or vacuum of the free theory. Okay, so what we said was that this is, let me show you what we actually uh, got. Wait, I'm sorry, you said this was for bosons? This is for fermions, it's a plus for bosons. No. So this is this anti-commutated psi plus, in other words, the annihilation part of psi L of x and the creation part of psi dagger, that anti-commutator minus theta y0 minus x0, the annihilation part of psi dagger of m of y, anti-commutator with the creation part of psi L of x. And the states are gone because these are just numbers. I mean, they're operators, but the anti-commutator is just a number. And that's because we're um, using these representations of the field. And you notice this is the uh, IPX. So this Dirac field satisfies the Dirac equation. That means the field has no interactions. It's the no interaction. So this is the mean value in the vacuum of the time order product of the fields that have the free field time dependence. That is to say, obey the Dirac equation. When we're talking about quantum electrodynamics, the, um, uh, the Dirac field no longer satisfies the Dirac equation, of course, what I forgot to say is Dirac equation means this thing is equal to zero. Instead, d slash plus m psi is equal to essentially a slash psi with a plus or minus e as a coefficient. That's the where a is the operator representing the electromagnetic field. All right. So we found that this is actually theta of x0 minus y0. And now this is minus gamma A D A plus M I gamma zero L M 
delta plus of x minus y. Well, I, I may have forgotten to say to you, this, if you pull this matrix part out in front, what's left, dqp over 2 pi q, 2 p 0, e to the i, p x minus y, that's delta plus of x minus y. And uh, something similar is what we found. Actually, it's, wait a second, there's something wrong here. This minus. is, it's delta plus of y minus x, so minus sign of x. So that's that. The next one is minus theta of y0 minus x0. But now, um, I unfortunately skipped a step. Suppose we pull this out to make this a derivative. Then this, what is this? This is the minus i means that we have gamma a dA because dA on x pulls out minus ip minus m i gamma 0 lm on delta plus of y minus x. So that's what this is. Is x minus 1? Oh, sorry. Never mind. That's it. So this is minus gamma a dA plus m i gamma 0 lm delta plus y minus x. All right, now, notice what's really cute here. This minus sign turns this minus sign into this, this should be a plus sign. Because this is one plus six. All right, wait a minute. That's right. This one is a plus sign. Thank you. So this minus sign turns this plus sign into this minus sign, and this minus sign turns this plus sign. Sorry, this is a minus sign. This minus sign turns that minus sign into this plus sign. Okay. Does anybody want to? Collect a, uh, a chocolate. <laughs> All right. So that's what we've got. So in other words, we can pull this derivative, the two derivatives, out in front, and we just have theta delta plus plus theta <coughs> delta plus, and that it turns out is the Feynman propagator. But there's no problem doing that and pulling the m term and the gammas and the spatial derivatives, but when you pull a time derivative across a heavy side function, you get a delta function. And so let me show you what happens there. going on is that the time derivative on theta of x0 minus y0 times delta plus of x minus y plus a time derivative on theta of y0 minus x0 delta plus of y minus x. So in other words, when you pull this thing out, the extra terms that you get are this one and Okay, let me let me do do the following. I'm going to make this a plus, this a minus and this a plus. So we can certainly do that. And that's why when we pull this thing across, we get the same term, the same time derivative. I'm leaving out the gammas. OK, well, this is, of course, delta of x0 minus y0, delta plus of x minus y. And this is minus delta of 
y0 minus x0 delta plus of y minus x. But the delta function is even. So this is really delta of x0 minus y0 times delta plus of x minus y minus delta plus of y minus x. All right. Now delta plus of y minus x is an integral d cubed p over 2 pi cubed 2p0 e to the ip y minus x. But if this is multiplied by delta of x0 minus y0, then the x0 minus, so let me multiply it. When it's multiplied by that, the time components here cancel because the delta function forces them to be equal. Okay, that only applies if you're integrating over p0, whereas we're just integrating over We are integrating over p0. Yes, we're integrating over the spatial parts of p. That's the right. Parts. Are we using an argument where the spatial parts are functions of the time parts, though? Well, it's just that. p0 over p0. It's just that we've got a function of. In other words, it's like this. f of x delta of x is the same thing as f of 0 delta of x. That's what I'm saying. And this is true as long as f isn't, isn't too singular. Um, good, 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 good observation. But this thing isn't terribly singular as x zero and y x x and y cross each other. So if we set x zero equal to y zero, then this is just a three-dimensional integration. But now you see you're integrating over all p. This is an even function of three vector p. So you can just as well integrate over in the opposite order and you can put a minus sign here. So in other words, this is the same thing as delta x0 minus y0 delta plus of x minus y. Okay, once we have that, then Then what we're dealing with is. Doesn't that set that earlier equation equal to zero? Huh? Doesn't that make it equal to zero? No. Zero. Oh, yeah, it makes that thing zero. Good, yes, of course. That means, in other words, that the. In other words, this whole term is zero. Good point. And the result then is that we can pull this matrix derivative thing out in front. And so what we get is time ordered product of, and this is this fermionic time ordering. write it as like this, times theta x0 minus y0 delta plus x minus y plus theta y0 minus x0 delta plus y minus x. But that means that this thing is in fact just minus gamma ADA plus m i gamma 0 Lm on what's called the Feynman propagator, minus i delta f of x minus y. You remember 
that I, when I, I went through with all the contour integration and everything showing you that minus i delta f was equal to the sum of these two things. This thing, in other words, is minus gamma a dA plus m i gamma zero lm times minus i and then an integral d fourth q over two pi to the fourth e to the i q x minus y over q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. And in fact, we can go one step further. We can combine the two i's and see what happens when the derivative comes through here. Well, the derivative comes through differentiating on x, it brings down an i cubed. And so this is equal to d fourth q. And the left arm is down, so you want to watch out here. Um, it's minus i gamma a q a plus m gamma zero lm over q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon e to the i q x minus y. So this is the Feynman propagator. And when I drew those lines earlier today, and I said you had, well, let's, let's, let's just do this. Here's a particular Feynman diagram. In fact, this is a diagram that represents electron-photon scattering in quantum electrodynamics. The electron comes in, this line here, Here's a photon coming in, one going out. This, in this Feynman diagram, this vertical line represents this, this number, or this function of uh, x minus y, if you want, or, um, well, yeah, that, as a space-time Feynman diagram, it represents this function of x minus y. One then goes into Fourier space, and everything is just a moment. All right, so I think we finished that. Um, let me ask you guys a question. Because okay. we've got um, two things. We've got a, um, a fork in the road, and as Yogi Berra said, come to a fork in the road, take it. Um, he had a number of quotes, and this, um, they're quite, quite amusing, some of them. Anyway. Um, What I can do next is I can do fermionic path integrals and derive this propagator from the path integral formulation. Or I can say, well, let's do quantum electrodynamics in the operator formula formulation and see some Feynman diagrams and so forth. So I can do, in other words, path integrals and then the operator formalism for uh, QED. Or I could do operator QED and then afterwards eventually get around to path integrals. So which would you like to see first? Operator QED, I think. Yeah, first yeah. one. I second that. It'd be okay if people do it. All right. Fine. We'll do operator QED next. And actually